So today I'm going to talk about stereotypy, assessing and designing uh, evidence-based interventions. Stereotypy. What are we talking about? Well, there isn't a unified definition on stereotypy, but stereotypy rep involves repetitive, invariant, contextually inappropriate operant motor movements that are maintained by automatic reinforcement. So repetitive, so these are one-off behaviors. These are behaviors that occur over and over and over again. And that the form or the topography of the behavior is also unvarying, such that how the behavior looked two months ago is very likely how the behavior looks today and very likely how the behavior might look two months from now. And so it's because of this, it's because these behaviors occur across a wide array of locations that they're contextually inappropriate. Cunningham and Schreiben back in 2008 said it's because of this contextually inappropriateness that they are socially stigmatizing. They are socially stigmatizing behaviors. I think it's important to conceptualize the operant one type of behavior from the respondent. An operant is a voluntary behavior, a learned behavior, a behavior that's maintained by contingencies of reinforcement. The respondent is a reflex. It is not maintained by contingencies of reinforcement. It's elicited by antecedent stimuli. How does this relate to stereotypy? Operants or rather stereotypy, are operants. Don't confuse them with ticks. Those are like respondents. So these are maintained by contingencies of reinforcement and specifically automatic reinforcement. Automatic reinforcement refers to the fact that another person need not be involved. It's not that I do a behavior and then somebody else gives me a high five or a pat on the back or access to food. It's rather I produce my own reinforcement. And for many people who engage in stereotypy, the behavior and the reinforcer are one. If you're looking through the research on stereotypy, many researchers divide them into two camps. Motor stereotypy, where you're using your hands or your trunk or your head. Or vocal stereotypy, where you're involving the, uh, the uh, vocal apparatus to produce sound. And it's more difficult to treat than, say, motor stereotypy because some of the tools that we use, like prompting, can't really be used to treat vocal stereotypy. And there's also a side effect with some of the treatments. Some treatments for vocal stereotypy that suppress it also decrease adaptive speech. And so we have to be careful around that. We don't want that to happen. The form or the topography of stereotypy is often very different. But in the behavioral sciences, we don't so much address the form or the topography of the behavior as much as we address function. We give precedence to function over form. And treatment is best uh, influenced by function more so than form. And there are four broad possible functions. There's two social reinforcers and two automatic reinforcers. Social positive reinforcement refers to a person emitting a behavior and as a result of what they do, somebody else does something, like give them attention, high fives, praise, pats on the back, or tangibles, access to food, games, or activities. Social negative reinforcement refers to doing something and as a result of what a person does, somebody else will take away something that that person finds aversive or unpleasant, such that they are escaping or avoiding the event. So imagine a little girl during math class and she's constantly screaming every time it's math class and as a result the teacher takes away the math assignment so she escapes it. That might inadvertently uh, be maintained by social negative reinforcement. Then there's two automatic reinforcers. There's automatic positive and automatic negative. Automatic positive refers to doing a behavior and as a result of that, you feel some self-pleasuring. On the way here today, I would, had the radio on and I was humming in the car. And so that humming could be an example of automatic positive reinforcement. Nobody else was providing me the reinforcement. I was producing it myself. With automatic negative reinforcement, the person escapes or avoids something unpleasant. Perhaps if I had an itch and I was scratching it, that would be an example of automatic negative reinforcement. 
So function over form. And as a result of this, we have to assess the function. And usually, this is the first step towards intervention. And in the behavioral sciences, functional analysis is considered the gold standard. And it's not a single approach. There's an excellent article by Iwata and Dozier from 2008, where they identify about nine different functional analysis approaches. And I've listed three of them here. With the multi-element approach, a participant experiences rapidly alternating conditions, whereby an experimenter would manipulate antecedents and or consequences and note their effects on behavior. We're trying to find out, can we turn on or turn off the behavior? And if we can, we've likely identified the function. As it relates to stereotypy, the extended alone condition is particularly relevant. We place a student in a room devoid of enriched items and see what happens when they're left alone. Again, if a behavior is maintained by attention, if it's maintained by escape or tangibles, we would ex expect those behaviors to happen less often. But behaviors maintained by automatic reinforcement, we tend to see them occur unabated, much like we did in the videos. Now sometimes the multi-element approach can be time consuming. This can take uh, days, sometimes weeks to do. And so there's been a revision to do a brief functional analysis. And this can be done in about a morning or an afternoon's time. But even that amount of time can be too time consuming, especially for some consultants who work with agencies whose funding structures don't uh, permit functional analysis. And so we might turn to indirect approaches. With an indirect approach, we're not directly observing the person's behavior. Rather, we're interviewing mom or dad or a school teacher. And we're asking them questions and relying on their vocal verbal behavior. And so two of the more common indirect assessments is the MAS, the Motivation Assessment Scale, and the QABF, the question about behavioral function. And I'd like to talk both about those now. The MAS was developed by Durand and Crimmins in the late 1980s, and it is the second most research indirect assessment tool. There's been a lot of research on the MAS. Unfortunately, much of that research does not support its use. For instance, there's low inter-rater reliability, low internal consistency, low construct validity. The MAS is less correlated with the data from experimental functional analysis than our other assessments, like the question about behavioral function. And even those who support its use, uh, Kearney and colleagues from 2006 say it really needs updating. And so for these reasons, some researchers have looked to a different tool the QABF, the question about behavioral function. It's more recent. It was developed by Matson and Volmer in the mid-1990s, and it is the indirect assessment tool with the most research behind it. It's empirically validated. It's effective. It can correctly identify function about 84% of the time, and it's efficient. It takes about 12 minutes to do. So even that brief assessment that takes perhaps a half a day, this takes 12 minutes to do, two or three minutes to score. It's really a 15 minute event. It's also the indirect tool with the best psychometrics in contrast to the MAS. So what does the QABF look like? Well, there's 25 questions. The interviewer interviews a respondent who knows the participant for at least six months, and the respondent has uh, regular, is regularly observing the problem behavior under question. So 25 questions, four point Likert-like scale. And there are five functions that this test assesses for. Attention, escape, the non-social, which is their wording for automatic positive reinforcement, physical, their wording for automatic negative reinforcement, and tangible. There are five questions for each of the five functions, so 25 questions in total. So I did a study with John Rapp that's currently out electronically, but will be published in the journal Research and Developmental Disabilities in the first issue of 2013. And we did a study with six participants, and the title was called, I have it written down here, The Convergent Validity of the Questions about Behavioral Function Scale and Functional Analysis for Problem Behavior Displayed by Individuals with Autism Spectrum Disorder. It's a very lengthy title. But what we did was we compared the scores from the QABF with the data from functional analysis to see how well they aligned. So 
draw your attention to the graph, you can see the top panel shows the data for participant 1, the middle panel for participant 2, and the bottom panel for participant 3. The left side of the graph shows the scores from the QABF. The right side of the graph shows the data from the functional analysis. Draw your attention to the y-axis on the left side and you can see the putative function score. On the QABF, there are five questions. The maximum score for each question is three. So three times five is 15. So the highest score that somebody can earn is a score of 15. On the x-axis, I've arrayed the functions, attention, escape, non-social, again that automatic positive reinforcement, the physical and the tangible. Above each bar, I've recorded the endorsement score. Now according to the administrative manual for the QABF, there are five questions. Every time a parent answers a question with a score of either 1, 2, or 3, so not 0, we would score affirmation that the parent thinks that this question might relate to the function. And so the highest possible score would be 5 on this. It could range from 0 to 5. And according to the decision rubrics, it works like this. Any function with a score of 4 or 5, with no other function scoring above 3, suggests the function. So you can see here that we have a score of 5, but none higher than 3. Score of 5, none higher than 3. Score of 5, none higher than 3. So following the rubrics, I would conclude that the likely function of this behavior is automatic reinforcement. So then we did extended no interaction series to confirm this in our functional analysis. And you can see on the y-axis the percentage of time engaged in stereotypy with sessions arrayed on the x-axis. And you can see with participant 1, at least 50% of the time he's engaging in stereotypy. For participant 2, she was engaged in stereotypy at least 60% of the time. And for participant 3, even in session 3, where it was the least, it still occurred. And if you look at the data path, it's showing an increasing, not a decreasing trend. And so this is very strong evidence that these behaviors continue in the absence of socially mediated consequences suggesting automatic reinforcement. And so for five of our six participants, the QABF aligned with the functional analysis data, and for the sixth participant, we had partial agreement. And so in our study, we refer to a study that Vollmer did in 1995 with his colleagues, in which he outlined a four-step process to do a functional analysis. First, doing a brief assessment. Why? Because it's time efficient. And if we get differentiated results, great, we can move straight into treatment. But if the results are inconclusive and not clear, then we can do the full functional analysis. Again, if the results are clear, we can move into treatment. If not, we can move into the extended no interaction series. If the behavior continues unabated in this phase, it strong, strongly suggests that the behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement and we can move into treatment. But what we're recommending in our paper is extending this to become a five-phase rubric so that we have a new first phase up here in which we would first do the QABF, the question about behavioral function. If results are differentiated, as they are in 84% of cases, we can move straight into treatment. But if not, then we can begin these other steps. So for assessing stereotypy, we can use the QABF, we can use functional analysis methodology. And once we've confirmed automatic reinforcement, then what? Well, then we can look to interventions. And interventions can be grouped into two camps. Intervention, uh, antecedent interventions, antecedents are events that come before behavior, and consequence interventions. Consequences are events that happen after a behavior. Let's take a look at these and then we'll flush out some of these in more detail. So the first one is environmental enrichment, also known in the literature as non-contingent reinforcement. Some researchers refer to NCR, some refer to EE. They're th the same. They're synonymous. I'm not a fan of the non-contingent reinforcement term. I don't think it is conceptually systematic for a number of reasons. Reinforcement is a consequence strategy. By definition, it's something we do after a behavior. But here, it's an antecedent. Reinforcement refers to consequences administered within a minute after a behavior. But again, 
It's an antecedent. And one of the, the features of reinforcement is that by definition, it increases the future probability of the behavior. But non-contingent reinforcement typically doesn't increase behavior. And so for this reason, I prefer environmental enrichment. And what can we do? Well, we can embed things that a learner likes, highly preferred stimuli. And they can be matched or unmatched. And this refers to the putative reinforcer maintaining each, each person's stereotypy. So for example, if I'm a person who's doing this, and I'm constantly looking at my, my fingers, I might be having some sort of visual stimulation. And if that's my hypothesis, I might embed visual stimulation uh, as part of the enriched activities. If I'm a person who makes vocal stereotypy, uh, I might theorize that I'm enjoying the sound. And so I could embed as part of the enriched materials some sound activities, like listening to a Walkman or a radio or something like that, that would be matched. Unmatched means that the, the pleasantness that is the enriched stimulus in no way relates to the reinforcing value of the stereotypy. So I'm going to talk about those in more detail in subsequent slides. Beginning in 1983, Reed did a study looking at non-contingent exercise. Having a person who's emitting stereotypy do aerobic exercise for 15 to 20 minutes. And what he found was this, is that in the 90 minutes following, people engaged in less stereotypy. It had an abolishing operation. But it's short-lived, it only lasts for 90 minutes, such that by the end of the 90 minutes, the person was emitting stereotypy similar to the baseline mean. And so unless we're gonna require the person to do aerobic exercise every 20 minutes, uh, this might not be a good strategy to use. And for this, there, this isn't where the thrust of research is today. In fact, environmental enrichment, non-contingent reinforcement, that's where the lion's share of antecedent interventions are. The second one, stimulus cues. I think this has a lot of potential. You know, I often tell my students that I'm not sure there's really such a thing as problem behaviors, as much as there are behaviors occurring at the wrong time. Just imagine screaming, for instance. Screaming in GM place when your team scores a goal, totally appropriate. Screaming at a place of worship or the library, not so much. Or how about punching somebody on the playground in the face? not appropriate. If you're being attacked by a mugger, that could be considered an appropriate response. Same behavior, different context that determine whether it's appropriate or not. And so we all have behaviors like this, right? We all have behaviors that are public and other behaviors that are private, that we do behind closed doors. And those behaviors that we do behind closed doors aren't necessarily inappropriate, they just aren't public behaviors. So one of the approaches that we can use with stereotypy is to teach uh, stimulus control. And in 2009, Rapp did a study where he held up a red card to a participant, and red meant no stereotypy. And then green card meant that you could emit stereotypy. And the participants evidenced differentiated responding. They discriminated between the red condition and the green condition. And I think this could be quite portable. I, I, I tried to find one this morning before I came in, but I didn't have one. Perhaps, is anyone wearing any of those colored, you know, uh, wristbands that you have for causes? You know, they have them for everything now, right? You can easily do one with a, a red rubber band for the no stereotypy condition, a green rubber band to indicate that you could, to differentiate the conditions when it's appropriate and when it's not. And there's some research supporting this application. Prompts, there isn't much research on the use of prompts as it relates to environmental enrichment, as it relates to stereotypy. But I think it's conceptually systematic, and I'm going to highlight uh, prompts in subsequent slides. For consequences, they fall into three camps, sensory extinction, reinforcement, and punishment. Extinction refers to allowing the person to emit the behavior, but blocking, masking, or otherwise preventing the specific reinforcer that's maintaining the problem behavior. This becomes very difficult to do with behaviors maintained by stereotypy. And in fact, with some problem behaviors, the reinforcer is the behavior itself. And so to rent the two apart, to separate the behavior from the maintaining consequence is done with great difficulty. And for this, much of contemporary research has looked to differential reinforcement and punishment.
DRO, differential reinforcement of other or zero behaviors. DRI, differential reinforcement of incompatible behaviors. And DRL, differential reinforcement of low rates, when at least some instances of the problem behavior can be tolerated. Just like environmental enrichment uh, has the lion's share of research for antecedents, what has the lion's share of research with consequences is punishment, specifically reprimands, response cost, and RIRD. And Bill uh, Ahern out of the New England Center for Children has uh, pioneered RIRD, response, interruption, and redirection. Response, interruption, and redirection. And so when a person emits a stereotypic behavior, a person goes up to them and asks them several tacting or introverbal type questions. What's your name? What's your address? What color's my shirt? What color's my eyes? And the research shows that this effectively decreases stereotypy and with some participants, there's a corollary benefit of increasing appropriate uh, speech. So let's take a look in more detail at some of these interventions. And I've included some of the uh, key articles so that if you wanted to do independent research, you could do so. So there's research showing that environmental enrichment or non-contingent reinforcement effectively reduces stereotypy. In Ahern and colleagues from 2005, they had a 13-year-old uh, who was diagnosed with autism and uh, pervasive developmental uh, delay. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, profound mental retardation, to use the language of the article. And they found that embedding enriching material reduced problem behaviors to near zero level. And what Ahern found was that the unmatched stimuli was more effective than the matched stimuli. The opposite results were found in the Piazza and colleagues 2000 article in which matched stimuli was found to be more effective than unmatched stimuli. Unfortunately, as effective as these strategies are, there's other research showing just the opposite, that when used as a standalone tactic, environmental enrichment does not reduce stereotypy to any clinically significant extent. In fact, in the Taylor and colleagues article from 2005, she compared environmental enrichment against DRO. The gains weren't uh, fabulous with environmental enrichment, but the DRO, the differential reinforcement of other behaviors, effectively reduced the problems to very low levels. But there's been two, I think, key articles in the field, one by Keeney and colleagues from 2000, and one by Falcomata, a replication, and his colleagues in 2004. And I'm going to speak to those because they're going to inform much of what I'm going to talk about. But first, I want to talk about response cost. It is a negative punishment procedure. And here's the definition here. A negative punishment procedure in which the loss of access to reinforcers contingent on a specific behavior reduces the future probability of that behavior. So a person has something they like, we take it away for a short period of time, 30 seconds, a minute, and thereafter we represent it back. Now, Many people aren't a big fan of punishments. We want to use non-punitive procedures uh, whenever we can, for sure. But back in 92, Blampede and Cahan did a study looking at the social validity of punishers. And they surveyed 201 people living in Christchurch, New Zealand. And they asked them to rate the social validity of five punishment procedures. Response cost, reprimands, time out, overcorrection, and corporal or physical punishment. And guess what had the highest social validity? It was response cost. In fact, I've ordered these in the order that they were found in the study. Response cost had the highest measure of social validity. Corporal or physical punishment had the least. And when we look to the literature, beginning with Weiner's six studies in the 1960s, there's been a consistent trend or a consistent trajectory in the research showing that response cost is a very effective uh, punisher to decrease problem behaviors. And perhaps it's because of this that these researchers, Keeney and Falcomata, turned to it. So in the Keeney and colleagues study, they had a 33-year-old woman named Shea who engaged in severe disruptive and aggressive behaviors maintained by escape and attention. They used environmental enrichment, had no effect. But then they used environmental enrichment and combined it with response cost 
and the problem behaviors reduce to very low, near zero levels. In the replication, Falco Mata and colleagues did essentially the same study with an 18-year-old named Derek who emitted vocal stereotypy maintained by automatic reinforcement. Again, environmental enrichment in the form of listening to a Walkman did not decrease his stereotypy to any clinically significant extent. But they combined it with a response cost procedure whereby contingent on emitting the vocal stereotypy, the enriching item was removed. And guess what? The behaviors reduced to zero levels. Huge gains by the addition of response cost. Now, one of the limitations of these studies is that one participant, Shay, one participant, Derek. And so in our 2011 publication, we wanted to ex extend this, and so we did it with two participants. And so uh, this study that I did with a Pananan, a Rudrud, and Rap. So let's take a look at this uh, study that I did. There were two participants, both of whom were diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder, and both were receiving behavior analytic services. They had been emitting repetitive vocal stereotypy and had been doing so for the previous three years prior to the start of our study. And they would say things like this, can I search Google now, can I search Google now? My doll is evil, my doll is evil. So they would repeat sentences or fragments of sentences. Both participants did this. So Olivia was aged 11 at the start of the study. Uh, she was a grade six student and she participated in a home-based after-school ABA program for whom I was her consultant. We had previously used verbal prompts and that did not work. Tanner was aged seven, enrolled in grade two, and he participated in a home-based summer ABA program, and the second author, Lisa Pananan, was his tutor working with him. And previously, RIRD, Response Interruption and Redirection, had tried and failed, as did verbal reprimand. So two previous punishment procedures had no effect on Tanner's stereotypy. So all sessions took place in the basements of their respective homes. Olivia had a self-contained therapy room in her house that contained a teaching table, two chairs, and wall-to-wall -wall supplies of education materials. And intervention was superimposed onto her therapy session. Tanner had an open concept family basement, so there wasn't a separate therapy room. It included a table for chairs, TV, bookshelf, and other supplies, and again, intervention was superimposed onto his therapy session. So what were the research designs? For Olivia, we used a brief reversal, specifically an AB, AB, AB with follow-up design. And for Tanner, we used a concurrent multiple baselines across conditions with embedded baseline probes. So let's take a look at these designs and take a look at the data. So here's the data for Olivia. Draw your attention to the y-axis. You can see the percentage of repeated vocalizations with sessions arrayed on the x-axis. The conditions have a condition line and are labeled BL for baseline, and treatment was environmental enrichment and response cost. So you can see baseline treatment, baseline treatment, baseline treatment with some follow-up. So let's take a look at the data from session one, our initial baseline probe. She was repeating herself 73 percent of the time. And this aligned with previous data that we collected where she was found to repeat herself three quarters or 75 percent of the time. In sessions two and three we instituted treatment and you can see that her stereotypy reduced to very low levels. In sessions four, five, and six, we reversed to baseline and saw an immediate increase similar or higher than the baseline probe. And then in session seven, eight, nine, we reinstituted treatment. And we can see again reductions to very low levels. We did a second baseline reversal in sessions 10 and 11, and you can see that the data increases. And then in sessions 12 and 13, when we did the final treatment, we can see that Olivia emitted zero instances in of a vocal stereotypy. We did an, an eight-month follow-up and a 12-month follow-up, and again, by the a year afterwards, the behaviors were happening at zero. There were no booster sessions taking place, and the length of time between session one and session 13 was one week. And at the end of session 13, Olivia said to me at the end something like this, I don't want to repeat myself anymore. This is kind of silly. I'm going to stop. And that was pretty much the end of it.
And how did it look? Well, she had this doll. She called it a sparkle doll and she really liked it. And she used it much like I would use a possession. So on my desk at work, I have pictures of loved ones and family members. And so during discrete trial training, we had her doll on her desk. She wasn't playing with it, she wasn't using it, it was just present. If she repeated herself, I just took the doll out of sight, put it underneath the table for 30 seconds, and then represented it. No problem behaviors, no interruption to our teaching sessions, dynamic results. Let's have a look at the second participant, Tanner. Again, Tanner had the multiple baseline across conditions with embedded reversal probes. So drawing your attention to the impossibly hard to read y-axis, responses per minute, with sessions arrayed on the x-axis. So task one at the top, task two at the bottom. Task one re represented Tanner working with his BI during discrete trial training, uh, working together in close proximity. Session or task two uh, indicated Tanner working independently on some sort of seated activity without the uh, tutor being immediately present. So let's take a look at the top panel and baseline. We see variable but uh, ongoing instances of stereotypy. What happens when we institute response cost? We see an immediate reduction to very low levels that became zero levels. And we can see during the reversal probes where we had these three data points going back to baseline, we see an increase. Similarly, during the bottom uh, tier, we can see variable but ongoing instances of vocal stereotypy, when the response cost procedure was implemented, we see a reduction to low levels that became zero levels, and Tanner stopped emitting vocal stereotypy. Now, there are some limitations. With the Keeney and Falcomata studies, there was only one participant. With my study that I did with Penan and Rudrid and Rapp, there were only two participants. And so there really is a lack of support for the generality of response cost for the treatment of stereotypy. And I think this next limitation is really important. I'd like to pause here for a second. In all of these studies, including the one that I cited that I did, we only assessed the immediate effects. So quite often in both the ABA fields and the PBS fields, we implement interventions within routines and we collect data during those routines. But we tend not to collect data after the fact. Let me give you an example. Two years ago, I was working with a young boy who had severe problem behaviors in the morning getting ready for school. Mother was at wit's end. And so we went in and I was there from seven to nine every morning. Mum went to a different part of the house and I got kiddo up and got him ready for school. By the end of the first week, we had uh, eliminated the problem behaviors. During the second week, Mum came in and started shadowing us. And then in the third week, we switched roles. Mum started doing the intervention, I was providing coaching and gains maintained. But the data that we collected was during that two hour window. What we didn't do was collect data while at school to see if there was a change in the behavior. And there's a behavioral phenomenon known as behavioral contrast that says this, that a behavior in one location, if we go to a different location, can have the opposite effect. So if we see a decrease at home, it's conceptually possible that there could be an increase after the fact. And virtually no one in the field is doing research to assess this. And so in an article that we have, uh, that we have submitted to JABA, uh, John Rapp and I looked at this to, to assess both the immediate effects as well as the subsequent effects. Are there changes after the fact? So let's take a look at this study. We had originally seven participants in the study. For one of the participants, they emitted sexualized behaviors that prevented us from videotaping uh, their behaviors. And so they were excluded. And we had uh, one participant for whom we could not identify any uh, reinforcers. And so they were excluded. So we had five participants, all of whom were diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder by clinicians independent of our study. They were enrolled in the same private school. They were receiving behavior analytic services, again, by consultants independent of our study. And all five emitted two forms of stereotypy. They all emitted a vocal stereotypy, and they all emitted either a gross motor or a fine motor stereotypy. And all conditions took place in one of two small rooms at the school, with room allocation being determined by the school principal. So this table 
indicates each participant's pseudonym in the left-hand column, their age at the start of the study in their middle column, and their targeted or primary stereotypy in the right-hand column. You'll note that Mark was the youngest, a child aged nine years and zero months, with Tom being the eldest, a young man aged 19 years and four months. And I highlight this because in the vast majority of studies on stereotypy, the participants are children. And so we have children, we have teens, and if you define adulthood as either 18 or 19 years, we have, a, albeit a, a young one, but we have a young adult. And so a measure of generality perhaps across ages. So for all dependent measures, we collected continuous duration recording. We collected continuous duration recording on both the targeted and the untargeted stereotypies, as well as how long each participant engaged with their emerging stimulus, as well as how much time they spent in response cost. Now for the purposes of today's presentation, I'm just going to talk about the targeted stereotypies uh, because the others are too time consuming. I also won't uh, belabor the inter-observer agreement, but our secondary observers collected data watching at least 60% of all sessions, and we achieved an IOA scores of at least 87.2%. Now, if you look at the IOA scores of stereotypy in published research, I have, they actually are some of the lowest IOA scores for target behaviors. So these are actually quite good for stereotypy behaviors. So we did three experiments. Let's take a look at our first experiment, a preference assessment, the purpose of which was to identify highly preferred stimuli. And we did so using two procedures. We used the RAISD, the Reinforcer Assessment for Individuals with Severe Disabilities, based on Fisher and colleagues from 1996. If you haven't read this article, I strongly commend it to your uh, reading portfolio. It's a great read. And of all the indirect means by which to assess preferences, I think this is perhaps the best. It's certainly very efficient. It takes only about 15 minutes. And it assesses different domains of stimulation. Uh, auditory, visual, olfactory, and then it hierarchically ranks those from most preferred to least preferred. So that even if you do nothing else, you get a list of potential reinforcers. And that's good to do with a, a wide variety of people with whom you work. I then conducted an experiment using the multiple stimulus preference assessment without replacement based on research by De Leon and Iwata from 1996. And what does this look like? Well, based on the items that were nominated here by the respondents, the parents, I then created a linear array, put the items, maybe perhaps the top eight, top nine, top ten in a row on the table. I invited the participant in, I identified each of the items, and then said, which one do you want? The participant ate it, if it was food, or if it was an activity they got to interact with for about 30 seconds. I then collected the item back and had them choose from the remaining items such that over time the items in the array got progressively smaller. Let me present the data for two participants that illustrate the range of the type of data we had. So here's the data for Brandon. Draw your attention to the y-axis. You can see the percentage that each item was chosen with his enriching items in the array. With the multiple stimulus preference assessment, we do it five times, or at least I did it five times for each participant in this study. And every time we did it, Brandon chose Mundo, a Play-Doh-like substance, first. So 100% of the time, it was chosen first. And so we decided to use this as his enriching stimulus in subsequent study. Here's the data for Amanda, the participant that you just saw. And you can see that her highest ranked item was raw cookie dough. Her second highest was cheesies. And we weren't going to use raw cookie dough or cheesies for several reasons. First, we didn't think that we would gain parental consent to make raw cookie dough nearly continuously available and have those sugary treats impact her behavior. And so we elected to use the uh, highest ranked non-food item, which for her was her three little pigs. So the first experiment was a preference assessment. The second was a uh, functional assessment. And here the purpose was to determine the consequences maintaining each participant's stereotypy. 
One of the students, Mark, participated in a multi-element design. The other four students participated in extended no interaction series. Let's take a look at first Mark's data. Draw your attention to the y-axis. You can see the percentage of time that he engaged in stereotypy with sessions arrayed on the x-axis. And you can see three data paths. The square data point represents the control or play condition in which Mark had lots of enriched items at his disposal. The triangle represents the demand or work condition and the circle represents the alone condition. And what we find is this, during the enriched environment, Mark was engaging in very little problem behaviors. When there was a demand, the stereotypy increased, but note the decreasing trend in the data path. The alone condition evidenced the highest instance of stereotypy, and following the decision-making rubrics of Hagopian and colleagues from 97, when a problem behavior occurs most often in the alone condition, assume an automatic reinforcer. And that's what we did with Mark. Let me just show the range of data for the participants who uh, participated in the No Interaction series. Here's the data for Brandon. And again, these are showing the percentage of time that he engaged in stereotypy. He was the participant who engaged in stereotypy most often during our assessment. Here's the data for Amanda. She engaged in it the least amount of time, but as you can see, even in session three, it wasn't at zero. It's continuing, again, suggestive of automatic reinforcement. So our first study, preference assessment. Our second study, a functional assessment. Our third study, a two-component multiple schedule design. And here you're gonna have to put on your thinking caps because this is where it gets a wee bit complicated. What I'm going to share today are the effects on the immediate effects of targeted stereotypies. I'm not gonna talk about the other parts just to make it a little bit simple. But on the next slide, which looks like this. I want you to uh, just be aware that only one sequence was implemented a day to increase experimental control, to better control for ordering and carryover effects. So let's take a look at this because this two component multiple schedule design isn't very common in the behavior analytic literature. And in fact, I don't think I've seen this exact iteration of the design previously, so, so it's quite new. So each sequence, only one of them was implemented a day. Let's take a look at each of them. Sequence one. Each of the sequences contained two components. Each of the components was 10 minutes in duration for a total of 20 minutes. So drawing your attention to sequence one, the no interaction component looked like this. In one of the treatment rooms, I invited one of the students in. Uh, it was made as austere as the natural environment would permit. So with the exception of a table, two chairs, and the video recording equipment, there was nothing else in the room. I said to each participant, you have free time, you can do what you want, and then all behaviors were ignored. That same description happened right here as well. The first component of sequence two was the environmental enrichment component, wherein prior to inviting in each participant, I placed on the table their highest ranked non-food item that we determined from our previous preference assessment. And I gave the same directive, you have free time, you can do what you want. After those 10 minutes, I took the items outside of the room and then we had a 10 minute no interaction component that was identical to these no interaction components. The first component of sequence three was identical to that of sequence two, except that we superimposed a response cost contingency. So immediately after one of the participants engaged in their targeted stereotypy, I removed their enriching stimulus for 15 seconds. After the 15 seconds, I represented it. And again, after this 10 minute component, there was a 10 minute no interaction component that was identical to those previously described. So let's take a look at the data. And for this and the following graphs, the graphs are constructed the same. So draw your attention to the y-axis. You'll see the percentage of time engaged in each participant's targeted stereotypy, which for Brandon was finger twisting, with sessions arrayed on the x-axis. In all of the, the subsequent graphs, the square data point represents the no interaction component, the circle represents the environmental enrichment, and the triangle represents the environmental enrichment paired with response cost.
So take a look at the no interaction data path and we see at what looks like an increasing trend such that over time Brandon is engaged in more stereotypy when he's left alone. If you look at the environmental enrichment data path, at least for part of it, it's paralleling the no interaction data path. Or said more simply, it's not causing any reduction. The presence of an environmentally enriching stimulus is not decreasing Brandon's finger twisting. But when the response cost is added, we see very low or zero levels of stereotypy and these are sustained across all five sessions. Here's the immediate data for Amanda's targeted stereotypy, non-contextual vocalizations. Again, draw your attention to that no interaction data path. And you can see variable but moderate to high durations of stereotypy. What happens when we embed the environmental enriching stimulus? Well, except for this initial session, they're quite high. It's not sustained reductions of stereotypy. By contrast, when we implement response cost with environmental enrichment, we see a reduction that's sustained and continues across the five sessions. Here's the immediate data from Mark's targeted stereotypy, ear play. In this graph, what I'd like you to do is look at both the no interaction and the environmental enrichment data paths together. And what you see is that they parallel one another. They both evidence an increasing trend followed by a decreasing trend. In other words, the addition of the environmental stimulus is not causing something that's entirely different from being left alone. But when we add the response cost component, we see a data path that's on an entirely different trajectory. And we see that on every subsequent session, Mark engages in less stereotypy. Here's the immediate data for Tom's targeted stereotypy, a motor stereotypy. He had rocking as his behavior. You can see a decreasing trend in the no interaction data path. What happens when we introduce an environmentally enriching stimulus? There's an initial reduction. But over time, there looks like there's an increasing trend such that as it continues, it seems to be less effective than doing nothing. But by contrast, when the response cost is added, we see an even more pronounced reduction. And again, it's stable across time. Here's the data for the last participant, Andrew. And you can see in his no interaction condition, high and stable durations of stereotypy. When we introduce the environmentally enriching stimulus, there's an initial reduction, but it increases over time such that there's not much difference. What happens when we add the response cost to environmental enrichment? We see a greater reduction, but you can see an increasing trend over time. If we had more time, ideally, this should have been continued to see if it's going to increase further. At any rate, it might well be possible that Andrew would require additional intervention beyond environmental enrichment and response cost. So, in conclusion of this study, we seem to support and extend the data of Keeney and colleagues, Falco Mata and colleagues, and Watkins and colleagues. In particular, environmental enrichment as a standalone tactic failed to remedy any person's stereotypy to any clinically significant extent. But when response cost was added, all participants showed uh, greater reductions, and for four out of the five, they were sustained across time. So where does this leave this? Where, how can we put this together into uh, recommendations that you might be able to use? Well, back in 2011, Hanley came up with five recommendations for the treatment of stereotypy, and we have highlighted a number of these this morning. First, assessment. We need to be able to ask, does the behavior persist when the behavior is alone? If it does, that's evidence of automatic reinforcement. And I suggested two ways that we could assess this through the question about behavioral function screener, which is really nice because it's not a protected uh, or restricted assessment. People who have undergraduate degrees can implement this study. Uh, and if that fails and we don't have good findings, then we could follow with a functional analysis. But it begins with an assessment first then doing an assessment for preference. And I identified two approaches there. The RAISD, the Reinforcement Assessment for Individuals with Severe Disabilities, and I recommended the Fisher and Colleagues article to you. Also, the Multiple Stimulus Preference Assessment without replacement is a great and simple way to assess 
uh, preferred items. And it's actually been refined. And in the refinement, Carr, C-A-R-R, Carr, Nicholson, and Higby did a refinement showing that instead of doing it five times, you can do it three times and the results are just as good. And so it's even more efficient uh, use of the procedure. So we need to identify preferences because whether we're using environmental enrichment or reinforcement based contingencies, we'll still need to do number one and number two. We need to find highly preferred items. We need to use prompts liberally. Now there isn't a lot of research on the use of prompts with environmental enrichment in the application of stereotopy. But I've seen this. A person engaging in their stereotopy we have an array of preferred stimuli, and guess what the person chooses to do? They prefer to do this, that the reinforcement value of this is greater than the reinforcement value for whatever's on the table, even though it's highly preferred stimuli. And so one of the ways that we can help is to prompt the person to engage with the item, and quite often they do. And I often use prompts in the study that I've just been citing. We didn't use prompts, but as a practical means of actually doing intervention, I would almost certainly use prompts with environmental enrichment. And very often, the learner stops the stereotypy and engages with the enriching stimulus. Hanley also recommends blocking attempts to engage in stereotypy. And if your participant, your learner, doesn't engage in other problem behaviors, this could be an appropriate uh, tactic. But if your learner is engaged in intractable stereotypy, very resistant to change, that's highly, highly reinforcing, then by stopping, blocking uh, that behavior, they may engage in other problem behaviors, self-injurious behavior, aggression, and if that's the case, we would not want to go there. I think number five is perhaps a really brilliant suggestion that Hanley makes, and that's to add and modify reinforcement contingencies to shape up the complexity of the alternative behavior. So what Hanley is saying here, it's not just good enough to give the person unrestricted access to preferred items and have them use those items in the same way today that they will six months from now, no, they'll likely satiate on that. They're not going to, they may become age inappropriate. So what we want to do is to increase the complexity of their interaction with the enriching stimulus. So to give you an example with, with Lego, say for some participants, Lego is their preferred stimulus and we give them four or five pieces, they snap them together, they pull them apart, they snap them together, great, they're not engaging in stereotypy. But it's likely they're going to get satiated on that and revert to their stereotypy. But we could shape up, through differential reinforcement, more complex interactions with the Lego. So they could start to form small, small objects, cars. They could build a house. They could build a larger Lego village, for instance. And you can well imagine that that takes considerably more time. And the longer the person engages with their enriching stimulus, the less likely they are to engage in stereotypy. And so I think that's a good recommendation that Hanley suggests. Hanley did not talk about punishment and so I've added this. So this is not part of his recommendations but given the research on response cost and the response interruption and redirection, uh, I, I think this is something to consider. My hunch is this, I'm not aware yet of any research on the social validity of response interruption and redirection. But here's my hunch, if people in the community were seeing this, they wouldn't perceive it as a punisher. It's somebody going up to the person, what's your name, what color is your hair, what color are my eyes? Great, let's go do something else. It's not like a verbal reprimand, it's not like a timeout, it's not like physical punishment. I think it might uh, occasion good amounts of social validity. And because there's been a number of studies showing that it's quite effective, I think a, a Schumacher and Rapp just did one very recently, showing that not only was it effective in the immediate extent, but they also assessed the subsequent effects. What happens after RIRD stops? Does the behavior accelerate, increase? Is there a subsequent establishing operation? No, there wasn't a subsequent establishing operation. That's really good because the last thing we want to do is introduce a strategy within a specific routine. Say, have an intervention being implemented at home, but then mom or dad have to go to the grocery store. 
but for whatever reason the intervention isn't implemented at the grocery store. So if mom or dad go to the grocery store and there's a subsequent establishing operation that makes the problem behavior worse, we sabotage mom or dad. We make it more frustrating for them. If anything, we want strategies that don't cause that or cause the opposite. Have this subsequent abolishing operation, making it less likely that the person will emit the problem behavior. And I think there's more research that's coming down the pike that's going to look at these subsequent effects because Across the behavioral sciences, much of the research is implemented within routines, not every waking moment of a learner's life. As I was preparing for uh, this slide, I actually thought of uh, point number six and punishment and Don Baer's article that he wrote for Psychology Today in a 1971 issue. And for those of you who study ABA, uh, our Bible, if you will, is uh, the White Book by Cooper Heron and Heward. And if you open, the dedication is to Don Baer, and perhaps the, the father of applied behavior analysis. And he wrote this, punishment is a legitimate therapeutic technique that is justifiable and commendable when it relieves persons of the even greater punishments that result from their own habitual behavior. And I want you to think about this, this quote in relation to the first participant, the person who is doing the, the continuous intractable hand flapping. Imagine that learner in a teaching situation at school. Imagine that learner in a life skills situation. Imagine that learner in a social skills opportunity. They're all lost opportunities if this learner is doing this. Uh, they're being hampered, they're being restricted, much more so by this behavior than say something like response cost or re response uh, interruption and redirection. And as any good punishment is, they tend to be very short-lived. If you have to use a punishment for months and months and months, it's the wrong procedure. Punishment generally produces very quick results uh, used only over a short period of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Thank you.